Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for gathering today. Today's session is organized by UNODC and also by the government of Japan. So we have today four speakers. And firstly, let me introduce briefly four speakers. Uh, Dr. Justice Tetti, from, uh, Chief of the Laboratory Science Section from UNODC. And also Mr. Jeremy Douglas, representative of Regional Office for Southeast Asia and the Pacific of UNODC. And you can see the right side of your face, Mr. Akagawa, Director of the Compliance and Narcotic Division from Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. And finally, Mr. Takesako, Director for International Organized Crimes, uh, sorry, International Organized Drugs and Firearms Investigation of National Police Agency. So, uh, <coughs> So first, uh, Dr. Dr. Teti has 15 minutes for briefing the report to be launched today here. And then later, uh, Mr. Douglas will add more information on the actual situation in Southeast Asia and Pacific situation on drug issues and also activities of UNODC. And finally, Mr. Takesako will explain about the situation in Japan on synthetic drugs. Uh, so first, uh, allow me to ask Mr. Akagawa to make a kind welcome speech and also explain on Japan's situation on NPS. Please, Mr. Akagawa. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Haru Akagawa, uh, Director of Compliance and Narcotics Division Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. I am very happy that you have come all the way from Australia to visit Japan. I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you. Japan has given high priority to anti-drug measures, especially against synthetic drugs. I am very proud and honored that uh, report of UNODC concerning synthetic drugs is going to be published today in Japan. I will explain Japanese NPS measures prior to publish of the report. In Japan, uh, the abuse of new psychoactive substances, NPS, uh, increase, increases very much uh, recently. Uh, these products that contain NPS have been sold as legal herbs. However, it is difficult to control these products by domestic laws because they do not include any uh, narcotics or uh, psychotropics. They are abused by use and cause health problems. Such products are sold indicating uh, disguised purpose in the forms such as herbs, aroma oil by a shop or internet in Japan. The directions absolutely not for human consumption, not to include any substance against the law or indicated on the package of these products. Also, every custom, customer knows that the products are sold for smoking purpose. When they use such a product, various symptoms appear. The main symptoms are said to be uneasiness, nausea, convulsions, uh, dyspnea. In Japan, the report of the health damage and the accident in connection with the NPS abuse, abuse trend to increase, and we are deeply concerned about the current situation. In Japan, 
Pharmaceutical Affairs Law was amended in 2007 to tackle such NPS, which established the designated substances as a new drug category and regulate NPS. The designated substances are defined as a substance of a higher probability of stimulating or depressing the central nervous system or uh, hallucinatory effects and causes damage to the public health, and they are listed individually. Pharmaceutical affairs law was amended last year again to prohibit manufacturing, supplying, and possession use, usage of designated substances. Uh, NPS will be designated rapidly when we have found that it has a potential harmful effect and it appears in the domestic market. Once its harmful effect has been actually confirmed afterwards, uh, the substance will be upgraded to a narcotic and controlled more strictly, for which severe penalty is imposed. We carry out regular survey of the suspected products in the market and monitor substances contained in such products. We have also been designating new substances in a regular basis based on the domestic surveillance data and the international trends of detection. However, new substances with minor chemical modification of existing substances appear, aiming to evade to control by the revised regulation as legal uh, alternatives. Such a cat and mouse game situation is an imperative challenge of public health. Upon designating designated substances, Japanese government has introduced more effective and comprehensive approach to cover these and analogs as a proactive measure. Because of the interaction, introduction of generic scheduling and acceleration of the designation, currently number of designated substances has become uh, 1,370 and bec became the 20 times more in these two years. On the other hand, harmful effects of NPS are not yet known to Japanese people. Some people misunderstand they are safe to use uh, simply because it is called legal herbs. Therefore, we carry out demanded reduction activities through enlightenment activities, including allowing public awareness of hazard. We have been actively allowing public attention to the risk through website, poster, etc., particularly for a younger generation, since such substances are regarded as an entry drug resulting in more serious abuse in future. We think that international cooperation is important for the the NPS problem where a new substance appears one after another. Japan would like to continue to cooperate with the UNODC and work on drug problem. Thank you for attention. Very much, Mr. Akagawa. <coughs> now, Justice, can, can you start the presentation? Thank you, Mr. Kagawa, for the very warm welcome. We would like to start by extending our appreciation to the government of Japan for the lead you've taken on the synthetic drugs issue and also for the collaboration we've had over the past number of years looking at this particular issue. 
I was reminded by my colleague Jeremy that the Global Smart Program, which, smart, which Japan is closely associated with, was actually conceived in Tokyo. So for us, it's like coming back home. Thank you very much. Mr. Kagawa spoke about the problem of NPS. It is something we're going to cover in this report, and we're also going to cover the amphetamine type stimulants. To give you a flavor of what this report sets to do, it is a triennial report, which means it comes out every three years. And traditionally, the report has covered amphetamine type stimulants. So amphetamines, methamphetamine, and ecstasy, for that matter. Times have changed remarkably since the 2011 report. On our markets, we now have a lot of new psychoactive substances, the so-called legal highs. And most of these are being sold on traditional ATS markets. So this report decided to look at both ATS and NPS. For those of you who have managed to go through the report, it also covers some plant substances, like CAT. CAT is not synthetic, but it contains chemicals which are controlled. And what is new about a CAT phenomenon is it is moving to areas where we previously did not have any issues with the plant. Okay. Through my presentation, you end up picking at least four key messages. And I'd want to put this out before we even start talking. The first message, methamphetamine, is on the rise. And it's not a small increase. It is a very significant increase, as you will see. The second key message is that East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific seems to be the main focus of trafficking for methamphetamine. The third message, NPS. We used to see that as a problem restricted to Western Europe and North America. You will see from the report, it's covered the whole world and products like spice, which previously had no grounds in the region, are now well established in East, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. And finally, when you've seen all the things the report seeks out to do, one key message we should take away is the importance of continuing with monitoring of these substances to be able to share knowledge and come up with appropriate policies to deal with them. Let's look at the current situation. Back in 2011, with our first report, one key message was that the consumption of ATS was more than that of cocaine and heroin combined, which is significant, because you're looking at two major problems, heroin, cocaine, and ATS exceeding it. Now, what do we see this year? If you look at the slides, global seizures went up to about 135 tons for all amphetamines. Methamphetamine was by far the biggest, accounting for about 109 tons. What is significant for our region is that most of the seizures of methamphetamine came from East, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Now let's look at the figures for 2010. Compare that with 2012. That is where you see the magnitude of the increase. It's 80% increase over a period of two years. If you look at amphetamines, and that's the orange color, that has been stable for the past three years, somewhere between 25 to 33 tons. And most of the seizures we are seeing are in the Middle East. The Middle East takes care of about 55% of all the amphetamine seizures we have on the market. That is where you carry your first message. Globally, it's on the increase. And not just on the increase, it is significant. And most of it occurs in this region. Now, the second major point we found in the report, it's the diversity of trafficking routes leading into Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific. 
Now, we know methamphetamine has been produced in the region, and there is a lot of movement between countries. But when you look at the graph, the important thing to note is West Africa. I'm picking up on the new things. Manufacturing has started in West Africa. And what you're getting is drugs moving from West Africa to Western Europe, or West Africa to Southern Africa, and then onwards towards Southeast Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific. Three years ago, this was not an issue. If you look at the statistics, seizures at Western European airports, if you look at seizures in Western Europe and seizures in Japan, stopped from West Africa, that accounted for 86% of all seizures going down that route. Now, there are other regions to worry about. See that arrow from North America, Mexico. It's coming from South America as well into the region. So the trafficking routes have increased massively. The Middle East is another route where lots of drugs are coming through into East Asia and the Pacific. Let's zoom in a bit into where these drugs are coming into East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. So key points, Western Europe, countries like Germany have been implicated in it. Western Asia, we know of methamphetamine from Iran. The Middle East is serving as a transit zone, and countries like the United Arab Emirates have had their ports used to bring substances in. North America and South America. So it's coming from all angles into our region. Now, within the region itself, there is a lot of activity. China remains the major source of the meth we see in the region. So from China, we notice methamphetamine going through South Korea into Japan, meth going to the Philippines, to New Zealand, to Australia, meth moving from Myanmar into Thailand, and also into Bangladesh. This is the issue we have with methamphetamine. The development in West Africa seems to have changed a lot of things. But let's not forget there are new places coming up, like East Africa, where we've seen a lot of diversion of the precursors. And that route is now established in terms of movement of drugs through the Middle East to Asia and Pacific. So that's a trend we need to keep an eye on for the near future. The report also covers NPS, which Mr. Kagawa brought up. If you look at the trends, Back in 2009, we had just about 166 new psychoactive substances reported. Now, within a short period of time, just over five years, we have 348 new substances on the market. In terms of NPS, just to give you examples, you would have heard of ketamine. It's very common in the region. You also have heard of things like spice, because they show up in the papers often, and bath salts. Now, we know of ketamine being prevalent in the region. But what's unusual is that the synthetic cannabinoids, common name spice, they work like cannabis, have now taken a firm hold in the region. Synthetic cannabinoids have been reported as the most frequent NPS in about 25% of cases from East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. If you compare this with ketamine, which is at 24, you will notice how much the market has changed over a period of about three years. In terms of what countries are seeing, Australia seems to be in the lead with the number of substances it has seen. That's about 31% of what's in the region, followed by New Zealand, at 17%, Singapore at about 8%, followed by Japan and China at par with about 5 to 7% of NPS. So there, there is a significant market in the region. Now this gives you an idea of the spread of NPS globally. 
94 countries have reported it to us officially over the period of this study. For the blank places on the map, it is not because they do not have NPS. It is because those countries do not traditionally report to us because of poor capacity to analyze data and report to the international community. So it could be more than 94 out of the 193 countries. Something interesting to note about NPS, and it's an issue Mr. Kagawa brought up. These substances are now coming on traditional illicit synthetic drug markets. What this report did was we took ecstasy, which traditionally contains MDMA, a very common illicit substance, and we tried to find out what ecstasy actually contains in different countries in different regions. So if you look at the chart, we took pills of ecstasy and looked at Asia, the Americas, Europe, and Oceania. Now let's take Asia because that's the region of interest to us today. If you look at ecstasy pills, they contain fluoromethcatinone, which is a bath salt, NPS. They contain ketamine. They contain MDPV. So people are being sold ecstasy, which has nothing to do with MDMA, but all to do with the new psychoactive substances. So you can see how this is taking a fair share of the market. Now one other observation was the increasing number in reports of synthetic cannabinoids. It brings up a question. Are people moving from cannabis to the synthetic forms? Will synthetic cannabinoids get established as a replacement for cannabis if you take out the cost. These are things to worry about. Now something you are all very conversant with, ketamine. If you look at seizures globally, more than 90% of seizures come from our region, mostly from China and India. Over the period from 2008 to 2012, we continue to see very high levels of ketamine seizures, perhaps not as high as they used to be in 2010, but still fairly significant, with most of these substances coming from China, Taiwan province of China, Malaysia, and India. Now, when you look at global seizures, that's the line on top. So that's the total global. You can see how five countries contribute significantly to what is seized worldwide. And that is something to look out for. Ketamine is one of the most important NPS, and it's been found in tablets sold as ecstasy and methamphetamine. So it is, it is worth keeping an eye on that. Looking at the flows of ketamine in the region, the region continues to, to supply most of the world with ketamine. From India and China, we get a lot of trafficking going to Western Europe and North America. We also see the two countries putting a lot of ketamine into other countries in the region, for example, Japan. So where are we now with this NPS? If you look at substances under international control, there are at the moment 234 substances controlled globally. As at the time this report went out, we now have 348 substances not controlled. So the world is having to deal with 348 substances plus 234. It's a huge number to worry about. We know these substances are of concern because they are being sold on illicit drug markets. And when sold on their own, they've shown to have detrimental effects to users. In fact, for most of these substances, we do not have any information on how toxic they are. We do not know what their short-term effects are going to be. We do not know what the long-term effects like carcinogenicity, et cetera, will be. But they are taking a very big percentage of the market, and it is important to keep an eye on it. 
This brings us to that last key message with the report seeks to send out to readers. The need to monitor the substances coming on the market. During the course of this study, UNODC, together with countries like Japan, have collaborated in setting up the first global early warning system. What the system will do to the world is make policymakers aware of the substances coming on the market. It makes law enforcement officers know what is out there so they can enforce properly. It allows laboratories to know what chemicals have been found so they can identify these when they come into countries and help protect our borders. This early warning advisory was set up in 2013 on World Drug Day. So we're looking at one year since it got on the market. And most of, this report, most of the data we've given you in the report actually come from this. It is important for not just Japan, but countries in the region to keep feeding information into this to enhance our understanding of the global ATS and NPS markets. Thank you. Mr. Petty. Now, would you please add some, Mr. Douglas? Good morning. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd also like to begin by thanking the government of Japan for organizing this event. As uh, Justice said, uh, we have a good reason to be here, which is that we have a long-standing partnership with the government of Japan in relation to uh, our assistance in drug control. What I'm going to talk about now is how we are looking ahead within Southeast Asia and East Asia and the Pacific to assist states to respond with some of the challenges which uh, Justice has just touched upon. I'm going to begin with a few themes myself um, and a few observations. Okay. Um, we very much rely on the technical expertise of our team in our Vienna headquarters to guide us on the substances and uh, the nature and range of substances on the market. In the field, what we do is we work with countries to implement programs to build their capacity to seize those drugs, to stop the flows of those drugs, to stop the money flows associated with those drugs, and also to assist states with uh, drug treatment, the health aspects. One thing that comes through in Southeast Asia is the vulnerability of a number of the states to the security, justice, law enforcement, and health challenges that arise from these drugs. Primarily methamphetamine still, which dominates the market, but as well ketamine, which was just touched upon. And those challenges are very much interlinked with organized crime, transnational organized crime, organized crime groups that do not respect the sovereign borders of the states of Southeast Asia or Pacific. We've conservatively estimated the illicit economy in Southeast Asia at roughly 90 billion US dollars per year. The largest single part of that illegal economy and the money flows is the drug economy, approximately one third of that. The largest part of that drug economy is the synthetic drug economy, more than heroin. It is valued at $16.3 billion per year. So to put that in perspective, $90 billion a year is twice the economy of Myanmar, the legitimate economy of Myanmar. Okay? It's eight times the economy of Cambodia, 13 times the economy of Laos. It's, it's in essence a mid-sized state, that economy, that $90 billion, which pumps through Southeast Asia every year. It's a very large flow of illegal money. And that flow of illegal money has an impact on the security of several states in the region because that money is used to fund groups, organized crime groups and insurgent groups in certain parts of the region. Uh, and it's used to corrupt public officials. It's used in ways that distort the state's economies. As a result of that, there's a need for strategic UN assistance and bilateral assistance in support of states. And very much recently what we're seeing is the speed with which this market is changing is in part affected by regional integration. So it's in support of the regional integration processes. So as I said, we've conservatively estimated the money flows in East Asia and the Pacific from transnational crime at $90 billion. 
the third of, a third of that being uh, the drug economy. The other amounts are related to counterfeit goods, are related to environmental crime and trafficking in persons, tr uh, human trafficking. But again, the drugs remain the largest single flow. One of the dominant forms of methamphetamine that we see in Southeast Asia is a tablet, a pill methamphetamine. In Thailand, they call it yaba. It primarily comes out of Myanmar, out of what's often termed the Golden Triangle. So we have seen, as Justice says, over the last few years, increases year on year in methamphetamine supply and trafficking around the world, in large part driven by seizures in East and Southeast Asia. In Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, we see this pill form of methamphetamine, and in southern China, we see this pill form. So we've seen a steady increase from 2008 to 2013. We're now looking at a roughly 143 million pills seized last year. That's our estimate at the moment for last year. That's an enormous volume of methamphetamine uh, production. Now that would indicate the scale of production within the Golden Triangle and within Myanmar is extremely significant because you have to keep in mind that a lot of this stuff would be going through. States have very low capacity, many of the states I've just mentioned, to stop and interdict those drugs. At the same time, we have seen a very large number of increases in labs the last few years. Excuse the, the, the miss on the thing there. We're looking at 385 labs in 2012 would have been seized by authorities in Southeast Asia. Now, to put that in perspective, that number doesn't sound very high, right? Compared to, say, the United States, where you might see a few thousand. There's a big difference in East and Southeast Asia in terms of methamphetamine production facilities. They are of an industrial scale or industrial nature. So what we see is an example is the one on the bottom, which is what is believed to be one of the largest methamphetamine labs ever seized, which was seized a few months ago, publicly reported by the government of China, which was seized with roughly three tons, metric tons, of methamphetamine in it. It is now estimated that that lab ran for five years producing methamphetamine at that industrial scale. So to feed the markets within the country, but also within the wider region. This type of facility would be the type of facility you would see in, in Myanmar, potentially in the Philippines, potentially in Indonesia, where these labs have been seized before. So those 385 would be fairly large scale uh, facilities. And they often, almost always, are run by transnational organized crime groups that migrate those facilities. So they're able to move them where they believe that they will be able to produce the drug. That's the unique nature of synthetic drugs, or NPS. You can produce it anywhere if you have the capacity, the know-how to produce it. So unlike heroin, where you can only produce it where you can grow the plant, we know geographically where heroin is coming from. We don't necessarily know with ATS. As I mentioned, what we are seeing is an acceleration, potentially, of the movement, in part related to other global forces at play. Now, in Southeast Asia, our organization programs in support of a, an organization of states called ASEAN. ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Now, ASEAN is, at the moment, aiming to be somewhat like the European Union, albeit at a very different level of capacity and different types of processes. What they're doing is lowering trade barriers, lowering visa barriers to move goods and people faster. And if you read the projections on their, their tourism numbers, you'll see the intent is to get people moving in and through the region much more quickly and to get goods moving in and through the region much more quickly. That has also an effect potentially on the movement of illegal goods, the movement of illicit trafficked goods or precursor chemicals used to make uh, narcotics, the largest sources of which are adjacent to ASEAN, India, and China. So what we are doing is programming in support of states' abilities to manage the downside risks or the risks that they may be experiencing from those integration processes. Now what I've got on the screen here is a little bit complicated. If you look at that, you'll see these colored lines, the point being that those are areas where the world is helping to build trade corridors across Southeast Asia. Now, why does that matter when it comes to ATS or to methamphetamine? Those trade corridors are being financed by Asian Development Bank, by bilateral partners, by development partners, including government of Japan, government of Canada, government of Australia, different governments that are supporting the economic growth of that region. They also happen to coincide, those red dots, 
indicate major methamphetamine production. So the major methamphetamine production nicely coincides and the trafficking routes for methamphetamine in Southeast Asia generally coincide often with the future projected plans of the integration processes of ASEAN, of the Asian Development Bank. So what we're seeing is the building of roads, bridges across the region in an effort to move goods and people faster. At the same time, the industrial scale methamphetamine production taking place within the region. So what we're seeing is the correlation of drug trafficking routes and ATS production areas. As we often say in our business, the best logistics experts in the world are traffickers. They move things better than anybody, and they do it without other people even knowing, often. Mostly, that's how they make their money. But if we do this, we often see also the ability to move. They may benefit very much from this economic integration. So what are we doing about it? So the UN has announced, UNODC has announced within Southeast Asia, a large integrated program in support of regional consolidation and regional integration, in support of the state's aims and objectives, but it's so that they can respond to their rule of law security challenges, which often rise from trafficking issues, particularly, say, for example, in this region, precursors and methamphetamine. And what we have is two direct programs in that support. It's hard to read, but we have two red boxes there. One is a transnational crime program, and another is a drugs and health program. And those two programs are directly in support of states' capacities, addressing state capacities in relation to drug use and drug trafficking and drug production. At the same time, we're running three other programs. One is on anti-corruption, one is on justice, and the anti-corruption program is dealing with the money flows that associate with organized crime. The justice program deals with police capacity because often police forces and justice systems need capacity built in specific ways to prosecute, investigate crimes. And then we have an anti-corruption, uh, sorry, a terrorism prevention program. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it also deals with proceeds of crime that fund terrorism. In some parts of the region, example, northern Myanmar, we do have groups that survive solely on drug money. Now, as I said, this is very much being done within assistance frameworks in relation to the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations. And what we're doing is programming in support of those. And finally, we're programming in support of other frameworks that which we pull states together to operate collaboratively. So that means that we get states together to agree on strategic priorities. And then through those, we can support them through assistance and capacity building. An example is next week in Beijing, there will be a large meeting of the six Mekong states to discuss exactly what the data which, we, which Justice just presented and which I just touched on myself. So we'll have the six states, China, Cambodia, under the chairmanship of China and UNODC, China, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam, agreeing to a strategic action plan to counter drug trafficking and production in the Mekong subregion, in the Mekong River system, and also to deal also with the drug use within that group of states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Douglas. And as a final speaker, uh, Mr. Takisaka, would you please give a presentation? Uh, good morning, and ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you, so my, my colleagues, for your very uh, in, in informative briefing. I'd like to make a comment on the assessment, especially about the methamphetamine, and and give a brief on Japanese situation. I'd like. I'd like you to refer to this this handout you 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 get at the reception. Mm. Uh, first of all, the most abused drug in Japan is methamphetamine, and we have a long history to fight against a methamphetamine abuse for nearly seventy years. So today's launch of the assessment here in Japan would be a significant outset. Uh, this uh, this chart this chart focusing on the number of arrests uh, last year. Methamphetamine offenders accounted for 84 percent, and as you can see, other drugs counted for a very small ratio. Uh, please please look at so page two, uh, the upper slide. Uh, this chart shows the types of methamphetamine offense. Use, use is the primary violation followed by possession. 
This means Japanese authorities arrest many end users. We believe this is a very effective way uh, to raise the awareness of the public. Uh, you, you may think of our policy as a kind of paternalism. Uh, next, so please, please refer to the refer to page two, uh, the lower slide. We are now deeply concerned about expansion of methamphetamine threat. Please, at the, please look at the bar graph, which shows you the, the amount of seized methamphetamine in Japan. Last year, the amount of seized methamphetamine almost tripled compared with recent years. Almost all of methamphetamine was seized in the uh, process of smuggling. Uh, please, at, uh, please look at page three. Now, I would like to mention one more point. Japan's problem with methamphetamine trafficking could be attributed to its extremely high price. We are concerned that this could motivate criminal organizations to smuggle more drugs into Japan. The street price of methamphetamine is extremely high in Japan. It's about 700 US dollars per gram. According to the report by UNODC, the price of methamphetamine in the US is $400 at most. I hope this doesn't mean that there are a lot of rich drug users in Japan, but means that our strict enforcement raises the scarcity of methamphetamine. Uh, please look at the lower slide. The current trend in methamphetamine smuggling into Japan points to a di diversification of origins. This is the ratio of each origins of methamphetamine smuggling cases in 2001 and 2013. In 2001, more than 90% cases of smuggling came from a Asian countries. But in 2013, the ratio of smuggling uh, from other areas has risen significantly. From this experience, you may find out the expansion of methamphetamine production and the globalization of the drug trafficking network. Next, uh, please refer to page four. Uh, this slide visually shows you the diversification of methamphetamine trafficking. In 2013, we detected 121 smuggling cases, and the countries and the regions of origin increased to 32. Now, methamphetamine is being smuggled into Japan from all over the world. This means that methamphetamine has spread globally and many countries, even where methamphetamine has not been abused yet, may become vulnerable to it. Why, why is this happening? Uh, the, there may be some reasons, uh, we guess. One, methamphetamine has a high street price, well, especially in Japan. Two, uh, methamphetamine can be cooked from chemicals which can be got easily. Three, there is no need to, ma to manage a la large farm as for opium, opium poppies or cocas. Four, uh, developing international transportation creates a lot of opportunities for organized crimes. Lastly, uh, I would like to show you three smuggling cases detected in Japan. The photo on the left on the left shows you the one from Mexico. In this case, we seed, seeded 200, uh, 240 kilograms of methamphetamine, uh, which was concealed in rollers of a rice spray, rice, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in rollers of a rice sprayer, a big machine for milling. The photo uh, in the middle shows you the one from Mexico too. In this case, we seized 190 kilograms of methamphetamine, which was concealed in iron ore. 
The photo on the right shows you the one from, from Kenya by way of Germany, China, and Korea. In this case, we seized 2.2 kilograms of methamphetamine, which was concealed between the narrow space of backslide of the backpack. The suspect, the suspect was recruited in Kenya, lured with air ticket to, to Japan. As you may see, in these three cases, methamphetamine was concealed very skillfully, and in two cases from Mexico, the methamphetamine was quite quite a huge amount. We are sure international criminal organizations are behind these cases, and we are determined to destroy these international criminal organizations in close collaboration with foreign authorities. Today, the assessment has, has made us realize again that synthetic drugs are spreading globally and rapidly more than we know. I hope UNODC to lead this area and Japan will make an effort to assist this project. NPA will continue to execute strict enforcement, uh, enforcement towards illicit drugs in cooperation with the foreign authorities. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Takesako. Now we have uh, 15 minutes, so let's move on to the questions and answers. And I see some faces from embassies and from uh, also relevant ministries and agencies, but you are not observers today, so please, everybody, feel free to make any comments or any questions. But also, please, identify yourself with names and organizations. And apologies for forgetting myself introducing me. Uh, my name is Wakaeda from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, so do you have any questions? Um, Hiroshi Shiyama from AFP, it's very nice to see you finally. Um, a question to the UN officers. I, I get the, uh, the increasing flow of people and, and, and goods are, uh, uh, is increasing the flow of drugs in Asia as well. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the why this high demand in the region for this product and uh, why the methamphetamine is the drug of choice. Um, and uh, so what's what's so unique about Asia and China is that is the rising income or rising the the gap between the rich and the poor is it causing the demand to rise? Um, and also, uh, what does the world or the region need to do to fight it? No matter why is it why is it uh, has it been so difficult to fight this crime? Um, and why is it the increasing trend is difficult to to curb? It? I'll start, uh, uh, maybe Justice may jump in. Um, there's a number of factors that are contributing to the rising demand in the region. Um, first and foremost, the, the region has had a long-standing problem, as has been touched on before by other speakers, uh, with methamphetamine use. So we have several countries in the region, example Thailand, with extremely high levels of use relative to other countries around the world. So some of the highest levels of use in the world. Okay, and they've traditionally had that. And that's been, uh, it, it originated as a drug that was taken a poor, by poor people, um, traditionally workers. That migrated into youth culture over a decade ago. And then more recently that has evolved into, uh, into a growing prosperous youth culture. So you have rising incomes occurring across the region, rising disposable incomes, and you have uh, a large, large youth population. So you have natural growth in the market, even if the percentage of population using stays roughly the same, the, gr the growth in that size of the population is, is there. Traffickers are very uh, good opportunists and know that there's rising income. Um, so they're, they're targeting that, uh, that uh, demographic. A good example is crystal ice, uh, ice or crystal methamphetamine in Thailand. I give you uh, an example. They per they pumped it into the market five years ago. You wouldn't see it in the market, local market. It was only dominated by pill methamphetamine at that time. Then they started dumping in at very cheap price crystal methamphetamine to build demand. They created the demand, and now they meet that demand. But they jacked the price, so they've increased the price subsequent to them creating the demand. And now you see very large volumes of crystal methamphetamine entering that market. One of the slides uh, that was just touched on by my colleague here, 
nicely also illustrates something that's occurring in Asia, which is Asia, because of its rising incomes, is being targeted by other regions of the world because methamphetamine is more expensive here than it is in the United States. So you see people trafficking it, trafficking it here to make more money. You also see foreign organized crime groups setting up within the region. So for example, a lot of you would have heard of something called the Sinaloa Cartel from Mexico. They've recently set up a lab in the Philippines, and that lab was taken down by the Philippine police, but they were very worried about that. Why would they set up there? Because they weren't setting it up to export back to Mexico, they were setting it up to service the, Mex the, the, the Philippine demand. So they're, they're looking at, they're opportunists, and they're looking at that large market, okay? The other thing you touched on is the movement. So we're having the ability for goods and people to move more quickly, including the precursor chemicals, okay, to make the drugs. And the largest sources of precursor chemicals in the world are within the region itself. India and China have very large chemical industries which produce the precursor chemicals. So the proximity to the market for the fi finished good plus the proximity for the market or the, of the precursors to, to produce that finished good. So you're seeing the movement of those chemicals into the region. So what do we have to do about it? We need to assist states with their ability to manage the chemicals, the precursor chemicals, which often many of the states don't have that capacity to do that. So for example, if you look at the Mekong subregion I mentioned earlier, some of those states do not have capacity to identify precursor chemicals, to investigate those that might be trafficking them. And then, of course, to identify even the labs that may be set up, uh, because those labs could be anywhere virtually. So we really need to build the capacity of these states to identify, investigate, and ultimately to prosecute, to stop these things, <coughs> and to regulate. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jeremy. If I may add a, a line or two to this. If you go back to 2008, when member states met to discuss solutions to this problem, because it's been with us for some time. One of the things they identified was understanding the problem. What is the extent of the ATS problem? Is it limited to regions? How far reaching it is it? We need to be able to understand this before we can come up with effective solutions. And the things member states identified as being core to understanding the problem was research, monitoring, of the situation, getting law enforcement and police officers sharing information and intelligence. But it wasn't just limited to the supply reduction issue. Member states realized that you need a balanced approach to solving this. So there is a supply reduction, but there is a demand reduction, the health side of things. Most of the people who are hooked on this are not on it out of their own will. So there is the need to try to wean them off it, have prevention programs and treatment programs in place. So you're looking at more research, more monitoring, more law enforcement cooperation to take care of the supply reduction, but also the demand side has to be taken care of in terms of preventing and treating people who are addicted to methamphetamine. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I see two questioners. Please go ahead from the. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Yukiko Toyoda from Kyoto News. Uh, obviously, in the report, in the presentation from yours, Japan is uh, one of the most uh, profitable market for drug uh, traffickers. Uh, could you give us a little bit more about the background? Why? What makes the Japan is one of the most important market for these traffickers? Thank, thank you for your question. Uh, so I, I, I explained this so in, in with my with my handout. So the the extremely high uh, street price is one one of the main main reason uh, to attract uh, drugs from all over the world. So we, we I, I guess, but to Mm, I, th I think this is the main reason, and so it, in historically, so uh, historically, so ja uh, Japan Japan has a long history, so long history, so fighting against fighting against uh, methamphetamine, 
because so uh, during during the World War Two, so the Japanese government so distributed so methamphetamine as, as a some as a med medicine to to students. So it 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 may be also one of the so historical background. I I think. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, please. Hello, my name is Natasha Irene Sandalen. I'm from the Royal Norwegian Embassy. And it was mentioned that the Japanese people are not that aware of the risks concerning the use of uh, specific drugs. And you also mentioned that uh, you had some information on your website regarding these risks. I'm wondering, are there any other programs in place informing the public about the risks? For example, programs with information campaigns in schools, etc., so that the information will actually reach the people. Thank you. From <laughs> narcotic control department, we start with that. So, uh, regarding the uh, public campaign uh, concern for to prevent the NPS, you ask new psychoactive substances. So, uh, currently uh, in the schools. Uh, every school uh, carried out anti-drug uh, curriculum, uh, but uh, anti-drug drug means uh, traditional narcotics and um, or methamphetamine. So we should uh, include, uh, in addition to uh, such traditional drugs, uh, uh, NPS is also, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, educated uh, in the school. Okay. Thank you very much. And please. Hello, I'm Michio Ishida with um, Singapore's Channel News Asia. Uh, my question is um, basically to Mr. Takesako. Uh, you mentioned about um, uh, lots of b drug abuse here in Japan. Um, could you tell me um, what sort of people um, take, I take these illegal drugs? Mm -hmm. And also, um, just a few days ago, uh, a well-known singer was arrested for his position of drugs and testing positive in his urine. Um, I was wondering if this sort of incident mm -hmm. Um, has an impact on Japanese society regarding drugs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. So, so just just like I said, so Japanese so law law enforcement agen agencies are strict strictly prosecute so end users, uh, but so I'm uh, re regret to say just. There are still some, some black markets, so 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 you you said so that the famous fa famous so famous singer so m m must have bought so some drugs from so under underground market, so but so now we we are st strictly so. Strictly, so controlling so underground market uh, in cross collaboration with the fo foreign authorities. So I I hope so in the near future, so Jap Japanese black market so will, will be so destroyed. I I hope so. Thank you very much. We don't have many time, but if you have, okay, please. I'm uh, Maria Miguchi with AP. Um, I have a question for Takesaku-san too. Um, you mentioned a triple increase of methamphetamine seizures mm. um, from two, uh, 2012 to mm. uh, 2013. And uh, could you explain a little bit uh, more details uh, why that happened? The reasons for the increase, and another question is, um, what kind of um, roles these days um, the gangsters in in Japan 
those uh, Yakuza groups serve in, in, in this uh, drug problems. Thank you very much. So the the main reason so last uh, why last year so we we see we see uh, uh, extremely huge amount of so methamphetamine is so mainly mainly so we 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 can we could detect so a huge huge smuggling cases so from Mexico so. Uh, just like as uh, I said, so recently, so a huge, huge, so drug trafficking, so network, network, so network, so um, uh, mm, it's targeting Japan as a so methamphetamine market. So may, may, maybe so because of the extremely high story, story high price. So I hear so the price of methamphetamine. Methamine, methamphetamine uh, becomes so ten times, ten times expensive than so or origin countries. So, so, so I think so. So, for example, so 2012, we we det we detected we we seized 348 kilograms of methamphetamine. But so actually, so I think so more meta methamphetamine was smuggled into Japan. So last uh, last year, so fortunately, so we we can. We can conduct a so cross collaboration from so foreign authorities and succeeded to to detect so more more methamphetamine. But so more methamphetamine. So just like as so explained, so methamphetamine has so spread it globally, and so any 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 country should so shall, shall be so vulnerable to methamphetamine. So. So today, so it, it, it's my pleasure to collaborate so with so even ODC and so ha we had we have opportunity to, to raise so raise public awareness. Thank you very much. Uh, yak yakuza groups. So the as I'm I'm sorry. So in this so in in, in these so smuggling cases, so we we we. We mm, we arrested so many so for foreign foreign nationals and so some some yakuza group members, but unfortunately so we 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 could not so reach the mastermind mastermind so of of this so of these smuggling cases. So we uh, we now so are making efforts to. To arrest the mastermind, so by by making use of so making use of so control deliveries and so high mm, I so mm, up up to date so in investigation techniques. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Or maybe you can question in Japanese later. So. Are there any questions? If not, okay, please. <coughs> My name is Stefano Carrervo, the Italian Economic Daily newspaper. Um, I saw this uh, ma world map uh, and um, I was happy because uh, there is no Italy as, <laughs> I mean, as a country from which uh, uh, methamphetamine are coming to Japan. But just a wonder, you have indication that uh, maybe also Italian organized crime groups could be involved and uh, regarding this list of countries in Europe, I think with the exception of Ireland and Sweden, the, the countries are the countries with the most uh, direct flight into Japan. So is uh, this a factor? I mean, uh, because the UK, Netherlands, Germany, and France are uh, prominent in this uh, map. Thanks. And so thank you very much. So just like so, as so Mr. Teti, my, my colleague Mr. Teti explained, so 
production of methamphetamine in Af African regions has, has become a serious problem. And so, so in, in many so smuggling cases so are detected, so you you just so by by way of so European European cities, but so the real origins are so uh, African African countries. So maybe so um, so you are your home countries. So Italy is not in, in, in included so so due to a uh, few so direct flights to to Japan, but so. I I'm worried that so methamphetamine from Af African regions so will will come to so your home country and so I I hope so national police agency Japan and so Italian law enforcement agency uh, could could deepen so our our so collaboration. <laughs> thank thank you. If I, if I may add to that. One of the messages we wanted to get out with the trafficking routes was how complicated, how complex it can be. If you look at production sites, let's take West Africa, for example. I don't think there are a number of direct flights going to Korea or to Japan, for that matter. Traffickers are clever. And if you look at the routes they're taking, West Africa to Western Europe, because you've got a number of flights, West Africa to the Middle East, because there are a number of flights. West Africa to South Africa or to East Africa before they make their way up. So if a country is not shown on this map, it does not necessarily mean that coming back in about a week or so, that country is not going to show. Because you're dealing with traffickers, you're dealing with organized criminals who know what we know and maybe are better resourced. So if they pick out countries who are not making their effort to close the gap, don't be surprised if you see your countries, Italy, for example, showing up the other time. That, that makes me finish off this question with a message. You're looking at a shared responsibility. Three years ago, when we pre presented a report, there were a number of countries or regions who did not appear on the trafficking routes. Three years down the line, you've seen all the places where there was low law enforcement at that time. West Africa, East Africa, where we noticed precursors being diverted about two or three years ago. The world watched. That is what is going to happen. In areas where we do not have very strong legislation, very strong enforcement, ve and we have weak government's will to make a difference, you are going to see those countries appearing very soon. This? Okay, can I cross the session?